One of the first things you'll do in a process control class is develop things referred to as dynamic models of a system. And the cool thing about it is as a chemical engineer, for instance, you finally get a chance to kind of incorporate and integrate all of your knowledge that you've learned so far, um, such as energy balances and mass balances and mole balances all into one thing. And we can begin to look at the bigger picture. So if you're actually running a chemical plant, for instance, how do you actually go about designing controllers to operate your reactors and keep things from blowing up? So uh, it is pretty exciting stuff. And in this video, I'll go through um, how we can go about doing that. And so in this case, what we're going to be looking at is an exothermic jacketed CSTR in which we have two moles of A reacting to form two moles of B. And because this is an exothermic reaction, heat is being released during the course of this reaction, meaning that delta H of reaction will be a negative value. And I uh, drew a diagram of what's going on here. Uh, so we can keep in mind of what's going on here. Uh, Tn is the temperature of the inlet feed. Cn is the concentration of A in the inlet feed. We're assuming there's no B in our inlet. Um, Q will be a volumetric flow rate. Uh, Ca will have units of moles per volume. Um, and uh, we also have a coolant jacket with Tc in going in and Tc leaving, as well as a uh, mass flow rate of our coolant denoted Wc. And the height of our CSTR is assumed to be a constant during this process. And so we will be making the well mixed assumption, a constant density assumption, a constant heat capacity, meaning that our heat capacity is not some function of temperature. Um, and we will also assume that there's no evaporation occurring because if there's evaporation, the height will change and uh, the math will get a lot more complicated. So um, making these assumptions and given this model, our goal is to build a dynamic model of this system. And so before we do anything, the first thing to ask yourself is what's changing in our process and what makes process control different from what we've done previously in chemical engineering courses is that we're not we're operating at steady state most of the time in a process control class. We're interested in startup behavior, shutdown behavior. And so um, a, a key note here is we're not at steady state usually. And so canceling out the accumulation term uh, that many of us have become um, very used to uh, is no longer going to apply. And so um, in all of our dynamic models, we will keep the time derivative component um, of our terms. And so uh, moving forward, what we see is the, the big question is what's changing in our system uh, with respect to time? And uh, another way of phrasing that is what do we care about? And uh, so intuitively, um, we care about four things in this process. One, we care about the concentration of A. We care about the concentration of B. We care about the temperature of our reactor. And we also care about the temperature of our coolant. And these are four parameters or uh, values that will be changing um, as we feed in A, as our reactor is starting up or shutting down, um, or even operating uh, as it normally is um, because there are perturbations that are occurring. And so what we're going to do is start turning to our mass balances and our energy balances to derive four equations that are associated with each one of these um, state variables. And so state variables um, is another term that we use frequently in uh, process control to denote anything that's changing with respect to time um, and we care about. And so the first one, CA, we're going to turn to a uh, mole balance, an overall mole balance of CA in our tank. Uh, so the change in A with respect to time, and this is equal to DNA dt, the number of moles, uh, will be equivalent to the number of moles that are entering our reactor as a function of time. So we'll have CA in times Q leaving our tank. We will have CA times Q and we also have CA reacting. And uh, another thing I forgot to note here is that we are given the uh, kinetics of our system, which were determined to be K naught times some exponential 
uh, and then the activation energy of A raised, um, divided by the temperature times Ca squared. And this has units of um, moles of B per volume. And so uh, we need to recognize that this is the number of moles of B that are consumed. For every mole of B that was consumed uh, or produced, we had to consume two moles of A. And so uh, we will have two times RB times our reactor volume V. And it is another uh, common thing just to keep the math a little bit cleaner is we'll let V be equal to some cross-sectional area AC uh, times a height H. The nice thing here is that we were given that our height is constant, so we have to worry about that. And um, if we move on to the next step and further evaluate this, we can pull out V here. So we'll recognize that DCAV DT, because V is a constant, comes out of our uh, derivative. And so now we have AC times H times DCA DT is equal to CAN times Q minus CA times Q minus 2 times K naught exponent minus EA over RT times CA squared times the reactor volume V. Um, which we established to be AC times H. And uh, we can isolate at this point uh, DCA DT. Sorry, one sec. I don't know why. Um, and so if we divide uh, both sides of our equation by AC times H, 1 over AC times H, we can isolate DCA DT like so. Sorry. And the next thing we're going to look at is a mole balance on B to see how its concentration is evolving with respect to time. So we'll have the same form, DCB DT. I'm going to pull out the volume just because uh, we did previously. Uh, and we'll assume we have no moles of B entering our system. We do have moles of B exiting our system. Um, and we also have a rate of formation, RB times V. And uh, if we plug in these values and simplify, we will end up getting DCB DT is equal to CB minus CB times Q plus K naught exponent minus EA over RT CA squared times V. The next thing we are interested in is the temperature of our reactor um, as a function of time. And this I shall call T. And to do that, we're going to turn to an enthalpy balance. As we'll call um, dH is equal to mCP dt. So this is what uh, we're going to be working with. Um, and so if we uh, begin to analyze this, what we'll have is dH dt is equal to dMCP t dt. And the mass of our reactor was equal to rho times V. We made a constant density assumption and a constant volume assumption. Um, so we can pull out M, and we're also going to make an assumption that CP is temperature independent, which also makes it time independent. So we can pull out CP as well. And we get uh, rho V CP DT DT is uh, the accumulation of enthalpy in our system. And this, uh, I'll rewrite down here because it gets a bit long. Um, rho V C P D T D T is equal to the enthalpy coming into our system, which will have the form um, rho times Q, density times the volumetric flow rate is equivalent to the mass flow rate, 
times the CP, the heat capacity of our system, times T in, that's enthalpy coming into our system, uh, and then we'll have enthalpy leaving our system, so rho Q, the mass, and then times CP times T out, and then we're losing energy to our heat jacket, minus U A H, so an overall heat transfer coefficient, times A H, which I call the interfacial area between the jacket and the uh, reactor, and then the temperature difference, which is the driving force for heat transfer, T minus T C, the temperature of the coolant, and uh, we also have a heat of reaction term occurring because we're dealing with an exothermic reaction. So this is equal to minus delta H reaction um, because delta H was negative. We need to throw this other negative here because temperature will increase as more moles of your exothermic reaction react. Um, sorry. And we're going to multiply this by the rate of reaction to get uh, energy per time. And that will have the form uh, K naught exponent minus EA over RT times CA squared times V. And so now if we divide all of these terms by uh, rho V CP, we can arrive at a, um, sorry, a yeah, final form of our um, how our temperature is evolving with respect to time in our reactor. And finally, what we're going to do is turn to the temperature of our coolant jacket. And again, we're going to use another enthalpy balance, but this time we're going to be doing it on the coolant. So DHC DT is equal to, and um, in this case, we've got the following where we have uh, DHC DT is equal to D times MC CPC TC DT. And uh, we're going to make the assumption that the coolant height or the mass of coolant in our jacket is constant over time. So we're going to um, pull that out as well as the heat capacity. And so this is really equal to MC CPC DTC dt and uh, if we now uh, perform another enthalpy balance on our system what we will arrive at is we'll have mc cpc dtc dt is equal to wc the mass flow rate of our coolant times its heat capacity cpc times the inlet temperature of the coolant tcn and then leaving we'll have wc CPC TC, and then we also have energy coming into our coolant um, thanks to the heat jacket or the, the heat transfer, which is UAH times T minus TC. And um, if we divide all of this by MC CPC, we can uh, cancel out these terms on this side. We end up with our equation that tells us how uh, the temperature of our coolant is evolving with time. And so uh, what we were able to do is arrive at these four um, equations that tell us how our uh, exothermic CSTR is evolving with time. And uh, this is the first step in a process control class. The next thing we're going to do is um, put these into state space and uh, do Laplace transforms uh, that will allow us to build process transfer functions um, out of them so that we can actually begin to make uh, feedback controllers to control these kinds of processes. And so this concludes uh, how we're able to do that, uh, make the dynamic models. I hope you guys find it useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.